asked me about a chi-square that he conducted. He described his findings as having a significance of 0.052, 5.2%. He said, the manual that we received from our university says the following, P less than 0 0.05, demonstrable difference between the population and the sample. P greater than 0 0.05, no demonstrable difference between the population and the sample. When I asked my teacher for an explanation, she said, if you strictly assume maximum 5%, then at 5.2%, there is no significant difference. If you are less strict and accept up to 10%, or round to whole numbers, then there is a significant difference. In the meantime, I don't understand anything anymore. Is my 5.2% significant or not? I understand your frustration, Rick. Let's sort out this question of just what makes a finding statistically significant. The confusion about judging when a finding is significant goes all the way back to an early disagreement in the history of statistics. The answer depends upon whether you are doing Ronald Fisher's significance testing or Jersey Neyman and Egan Pearson's hypothesis testing. The most famous of Sir Ronald Fisher's statistical illustrations was about a lady tasting tea. A group of scientists had gathered one afternoon for tea. One of them, Dr. Muriel Bristol, insisted that she could taste whether the tea was prepared adding the milk first and then adding the tea, or the tea first and then adding the milk. Fisher among the many who were skeptical that there really was a difference in the taste of the tea, put Dr. Bristol's claim to the test. He asked the kitchen to bring eight cups of tea, four in which the milk was added first and four in which the milk was added last. The tea would be presented to the tasters in a random order. If there really was no difference in the taste of the tea, then Dr. Bristol could be expected to correctly guess 50% of the cups just by chance. So simply guess, guessing 50% isn't good enough. So then here's the question. What percentage should she be expected to get correct before you would trust that she could in fact taste a difference in the taste of the tea? 80% correct? 90% correct? 95% correct? Now personally, I would say that if she got 90% of the cups correct, that's good enough evidence for me that she can, in fact, taste a difference. It would be really hard to get 90% correct just by chance. But how about you? How much evidence do you require before you are convinced to reject Fisher's skepticism that there really is no difference in the taste of the tea? If she correctly identified 95% of the teas, would you be convinced? I would. Now, how about if she correctly identified only 94.8% of the T's? Would you now say that she'd failed? I wouldn't. I'd say that she had performed the same. <laughs> if you're doing Sir Ronald Fisher's significance testing using probabilities to establish the amount of evidence against the null hypothesis, then 0.052 provides exactly the same amount of evidence against the null hypothesis as 0.05 and 0.048. The only reason for the fluctuations around that 5% cutoff are random error and sample size. The underlying effect that you are measuring is exactly the same. So Rick, your 0.052 is just as convincing evidence against the null hypothesis as 0.05 unless you're doing hypothesis testing. Well, let's pretend that we did this tea tasting experiment with thousands of tasters 
and hundreds of thousands of cups of tea over hundreds of experiments across multiple years. Now we want to identify which tasters can taste the difference in the tea and separate them into one group based upon their effectiveness. Now our null hypothesis is that none of the tasters can taste a difference between the teas. We need to stipulate from the outset that we will only count as accurate those who correctly identify 95% of the cups of tea. We will abandon our assumption that there is no difference in the tea tasting ability only if the tea tasters correctly identify 95% of the teas that they taste. We want to set a really high criterion for deciding. It would be a big deal if I used 90% versus 95% because that 5% or 10% criterion for significance is also our type 1 error rate. When doing hypothesis testing, trying to determine whether there is a significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis, we may examine multiple studies, perhaps thousands of data points. At 95%, 0.05, Conceivably, we could falsely identify as many as 5% of our tea tasters as accurate just because they guessed correctly by random chance. With a large enough sample, some people are going to get lucky at guessing, even if they could not really taste a difference. And that would be a mistake, a type 1 error, saying that there is a difference when there is truly not a false positive. However, by strictly adhering to a significance criterion of 95%, we are limiting our error rate to only 5%. And this is why we need to stick tightly to that 95% criteria. The difference between 0.05 and 0.052 could be considerable over a long-term hypothesis testing. Certainly, the difference between a 5% error and a 10% error could be substantial, perhaps catastrophic, in the right setting. When we are doing what Jersey Naiman and Egan Pearson called hypothesis testing, we should strictly adhere to our established criterion of significance and refuse to reject the null hypothesis on studies that do not exceed our 0.05 criteria. So Rick, your p-value of 0.052 is not statistically significant, and there is not significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis in your study. Unless, of course, you were doing significance testing. The fundamental reason for your confusion, Rick, is that the field of statistics has conflated these two approaches, from Fisher and from Neyman and Pearson into a hybrid Frankenstats approach that is called NHST, or Null Hypothesis Statistical Testing, what Jacob Cohen called Statistical Hypothesis Inference Testing. Make your own acronym. NHST adheres to Neyman's strict criteria for significance in hypothesis testing when doing Fisher's significance testing. Furthermore, NHST largely ignores the effect of sample size on significance, such that exactly the same effect size will be significant in a large sample, even though it is non-significant in a small sample. Leading to researchers concluding that 0.052 is a failure and 0.048 is a success, when in fact it's the same outcome it leads people to think that that 0.05 is somehow a magical criterion distinguishing truth from falsehood. It doesn't. We are scientists, not magicians. So it's not your fault, Rick, that you're confused. This statistical hypothesis inference testing is confusing. Your solution, therefore, is twofold. Number one, always consider power when you design your test. Do a power analysis before collecting data. How many subjects will you reasonably need 
in order to find statistical significance for your effect size. And B, always report the effect size of your study when you report a p-value for a test. I would suggest reporting the 0.052 significance along with your Kramer's V effect size for your chi-square. Follow those two rules and you will be doing statistics well. Oh, and by the way, the real Dr. Muriel Bristol correctly identified all eight cups of tea. <music>